We have two stocks to talk about in today's video, FICO and Disney. Both of these companies just reported earnings yesterday after market close, and both of them are doing pretty well. FICO's up 3% after hours, or rather today, and we have Disney up 7.56% today. So investors seem to have liked these earnings reports, but we're going to decide for ourselves. I'm going to be jumping in and I'll be the judge of whether or not these were really that good. We're also going to be looking over the next year, their forecasts, their fundamentals, what the valuations are of these two companies. And we're going to explain a little bit more of what FICO actually is, because most people know about this company as just the FICO score, but they do quite a bit outside of that. So this is going to be a very educational and I think a fun video. Another thing I'll mention is as we go through this, I'll be referencing this website. This is Qualtrum.com, which if you haven't tried it out already, I think you're missing out. Give it a shot. It's free to try. It comes with a month long free trial. Join the Patreon and you gain access to this website. The link to the Patreon's in the pinned comment below. Now let's go ahead and jump in. I'll start off by saying that I do not currently own either of these companies, but I'm always looking at different companies as potential investments. I have two portfolios that I track. One of them is the passive income portfolio. I track that on my other YouTube channel. There's a link to that as well. But this one has been doing really well. It's been performing really well for a couple of years now. This year, it's beating SPY by just a couple percentage points. So we're hanging in there, doing well this year. And this has been a difficult year for individual stock pickers. But this portfolio is doing great. Last year, this also outperformed the S&P 500 by around 2%. So it's really held up well. It's not doing massively better than SPY. But it's beating it both on down years and up years, which I think is good. The story fund has been a bit more volatile. It had a lot of trouble last year. This portfolio tanked. That wasn't good. But this year it's made a remarkable recovery, going up 54%. The investments that I made really have started paying off and I'm seeing that come through. The strategy, what I'm looking for in companies, and what I'm always looking for when reviewing companies are compounders, compounding machines. Companies that will continue to grow their net income, their earnings per share, their revenue, their free cash flow, their free cash flow per share, year after year after year. And then they have very simple capital allocation strategies where they pour money into buybacks and dividends. These companies typically grow at faster rates than the S&P 500. And if you can find the right ones and let them compound for a long period of time, these ones can make a lot of gains over a long period of time. So I'm still focused on compounders. I'm still buying compounding machines. When I go to the drive-thru, I order a double compounder and cheese. That last part's a joke. Now let's go ahead and jump in. We'll start off with FICO. Is this company really all it's talked up to be? Well, let's go ahead and just review what business FICO's actually in. Most of you are probably familiar with the name FICO. The FICO score is a rating on your ability to pay back a loan. It is a credit worthiness rating, and it's most commonly used and associated with loan origination. So think of the FICO score whenever you're going to get a car loan or a solar loan or a home mortgage. They're probably gonna run a FICO score whenever you do that because that gives the bank or the lender a better ability to judge whether or not you can pay them back. Then they can appropriately attach an interest rate to your loan. If you have a high ability to pay back a loan, you'll get a lower interest rate. And the FICO score is part of that calculation. It's not the only thing the banks use, but it's an important part of it. And the value proposition is incredible. Because consider this, the FICO score may cost around, let's say $1 to run for a potential lender. So the bank pays this de minimis expense of $1 where they can better judge whether or not you can pay back a $600,000 home loan. Again, would you pay $1 to know whether or not someone's going to pay you back $600,000? Of course, it's way worth it. In fact, the expense to the lender of running the actual FICO score is so small, it's so de minimis that it doesn't really even matter. It doesn't really even factor into their overall calculation. And when you dive into this, it's actually difficult to find out who's actually paying for this score. Is it the lender? Is it the credit rating agencies? It's buried within the loan origination costs. So I think it may be the customer paying for it. Someone is, but nobody seems to care. Because again, the score is $1 and the overall cost of the thing they're getting a loan for is typically over $50,000. 
so it is a tiny fraction of the overall expense masking any of the cost of the FICO score. That is the value proposition of it. Now the FICO score also has barriers to entry. There is AI that's doing loan origination rating that hasn't worked out really well. There's other competitors like Vantage Score that's most commonly used for credit card and other consumer products. FICO is basically the king of rating loan originations and the ability for the consumer to pay back. So that's what it's commonly used for. It seems to be growing every single year in volume as the overall economy grows, but that FICO score is a high margin, incredibly good product that is just a money printer. It really is like J-PAL just came over and gave them their money printer. That's the FICO score. Now the FICO score is so widely successful, so widely accepted, it has such a large moat, and it's so incredibly profitable that this company is just like a geyser spewing forth cash every single day, and they don't know what to do with all of that money. So they start coming up with ideas, and the thing that they started to develop with the extra cash flow was an analytics platform. Now, this is a part of the business that a lot of people don't know about. They know about the FICO score, but they don't know about the analytics platform. And this analytics platform has become roughly half of the total revenue of the business, and it's growing faster than the FICO score. So FICO, the score, makes up roughly 50% of revenues. The analytics platform makes up the other 50%. What is that analytics platform? Let's go ahead and take a look. We're here at the FICO website and we have solutions here. And this will give you a little bit of what this analytics business platform does. They have application fraud, application risk models, card fraud, collection and recovery, consortium scores and account management, consumer credit scores, customer acquisition, customer communication, management, enterprise, fraud, uh, deposits, driving risk scores, enterprise fraud innovation, financial inclusion and growth, healthcare scores, so on and so forth. There's so many different services they offer. Under the products, they have FICO Advisor, the Business Outcome Simulator, Card Alert Services, Customer Analytics. They have a Falcon platform that's a Compromise Manager, Fraud Manager, Forecaster, Small Business Scoring Services, uh, on and on and on. You can see all these different business applications they're offering. Now, you may not be intimately familiar with all of these different types of products, but these are desperately needed for different businesses. Fraud detection and security, these are all things that are desperately needed. So since they already have this, again, wildly successful money printer, which is the FICO score, they have a constant stream to be able to fund the programming and development of all these different products and solutions. So they're growing out another SaaS application on top of their primary business. And again, this SaaS application, this analytics platform is surpassing the FICO score in revenue. So that is the business. FICO is a incredibly strong business that has some diversification, multiple forms of revenue. I would say that the mode of the company is very strong, especially for a $20 billion company. A lot of companies that are below $50 billion they don't have the strongest moat because typically they grow bigger and bigger when they do. But this is a company with a very powerful moat, brand recognition, very good efficiency, and it's a, a smaller company, $23 billion, which is much smaller than companies like S&P Global or companies like MasterCard or Visa. Now, the financials of this company have been amazing. Let's take a look at the free cash flow here. You'll notice that it had a little bit of an up and down with... Uh, you know, in 2005 to 2009, again, they're competing fiercely here. There's a lot of different things that happened. They didn't exercise any pricing power here. So there is some downside here, but in the past 10 years, this company has been a growth machine. Growing the free cash flows, 15% per year over the past 10 years. Now, if we look at this on a per share basis, because FICO does share buybacks so aggressively, this company grew at even a faster pace. Check out the free cash flow per share. It has excelled. In fact, it's gone up exponentially over the past five years, growing 24% over the past five years. That is right there or above what Meta has, Google, Amazon, all these big tech giants. They've grown their free cash flow per share faster than these companies. And again, this is just a $20 billion company. It's a big one, but it's not a huge gargantuan megatech company. So I'm really impressed by what this company's done. They've built this incredibly profitable business and they've somehow managed to diversify it while maintaining and even growing the profit margins. Now, 
Let's go ahead and take a look at the most recent earnings report. First of all, we have net income growth year over year. This was a bit minor. We went from 90 million to 101. That's good. They increased net income year over year. The fiscal 2023 revenue, it grew from 348 to 389. So strong revenue growth year over year. I like seeing that. They said we had another great year posting strong double digit growth across all our metrics. Double digit growth across every metric scrape. We also are pleased to provide our financial 2024 guidance, which includes double digit percentage revenue and EPS growth, demonstrating the, the remarkable resilience in our business model, even in an uncertain macroeconomic environment. Now, there's some truth to what they're saying here in the uncertainty. I would assume that FICO, specifically the FICO score, not the analytics part, but the FICO score part would actually have less revenue this year than last year. Because if you went to a realtor right now, you would know that the housing market is basically at a standstill. Nobody wants to sell their homes. So realtors are basically saying it's like, it's just like a desert with a tumbly weed. There's nothing going on in real estate. Things have slowed down so much because of interest rates. Well, again, FICO makes their money by loan origination. So the more turnover, the more houses being sold, the more they can run their, their score. If there's not many people buying homes or solar or cars, that slows down their volume growth dramatically. Well, let's go ahead and take a look here. They break it up into the two different categories. And they say right here that the scores revenue, which includes the company's business to business scoring solutions and business to consumer, was 195.6 million in the fourth quarter compared to 174. They grew scores revenue despite the real estate market right now. They still grew it. Now, when I read this, I know the only way they grew that score revenue is by price increases. There is no way that volume grew year over year. So let's go ahead and take a look here. That's an increase of 12% and 21% driven largely by price increases, which were partially offset by declines in origination volumes. So another way of putting this, FICO just grew their score revenue 12% and 21% year over year with volumes going down. That's how aggressive their price increases have been. Volumes are down, revenues up 12 and 21%. Now imagine, just for a minute, if volumes pick back up and they still do price increases. That number's gonna skyrocket. Their revenue will be growing 30, 40, 50% year over year. If volume picks up and they're doing price increases, that's two things moving in the right direction. This is the importance of pricing power. This company has volume declining, but they can increase prices so much that they're still growing revenue, which is incredible. Now the software revenue, again, this is the analytic side of it, which include the company's analytic and digital decision technology was 194.2 million versus 174, an increase of 11%. Now, a lot of people are not familiar with the net dollar retention rate of software companies, but if you look at them, the industry standard of a good net, net retention rate is 120% or above. So they did great here. Looking at this report, they're growing their software year over year. The scores have slowed down in volume, which is something out of their control, but because of their immense pricing power, they still managed to grow revenue of the scores. Their moat's still intact and they're highly profitable. From this earnings report, I think that FICO's in great shape. I didn't see any red flags whatsoever. So this is a company that's definitely on my watch list. I wanna find a good entry point with this company. I missed the last little dip, it just wasn't enough for me. So I've been on the sidelines, but I might be there a long time because this stock has a habit of just going up further and further. That is because of the very clear route of free cash flows and the very clear policy of reinvestment and doing buybacks. This company is a tremendous compounder. Now, next up, we have Disney, which is currently at $91 per share. It's up 7.8% today after its earnings. And Disney's a company that I've been rooting for. I want this company to succeed. They have such excellent properties that they should be able to churn out profits. And I felt like the company was being mismanaged by Bob Chapek. I think he had a lot of issues with, he got into politics, people didn't like that. And if you do get into politics, at least manage it well. He did it poorly, where he wasn't communicating well. He just upset a lot of his fans. Uh, they also really pushed tons of content onto Disney+, Plus. that a lot of it was subpar. 
They were mismanaging ESPN, they were losing contracts to Amazon and Apple, and so on and so forth. Now, Bob Iger, who picked Bob Chapek, ended up firing him and came back to save the day, and it was very messy. But here we are with Disney. We're back on a growth path, and hopefully Bob Iger can turn it around. Disney expands cost-cutting plan by $2 billion, and they post better than expected profits. So let's go ahead and first take a look at the actual numbers here. I have them highlighted. We have 82 cents of earnings per share versus 70. So we have a beat there. The revenue came in just under expectations. Who cares about that? It's basically in line. And here's the important one. They beat on their Disney Plus subscribers. They now have 150.2 million. Now they break this up into multiple brackets here. And I think this chart by Alex best illustrates it. But you have in the red here, Disney Plus Hotstar, which are the very cheap subscribers. They're not from the US. These are like maybe a dollar or two a month. They're super cheap plans. And this is not the same as Disney Plus. Disney Plus is in blue. So you're seeing that the hot star is going down because Disney decided to forego renewing a lot of contracts with sporting events. So a lot of people are canceling Disney Plus hot star, but Disney Plus core, which is the service we have in the US, that is increasing. It went up from 106 to 113. So very strong growth from their streaming service. And that is critical. I guarantee you, if this went flat or it went down, Disney stock would be down another 10%. So this, this bar right here going up from 106 to 113, that is what made the difference with the stock. Now, Baba Iger was asked some questions on this earnings report. Let's go ahead and take a look. Well, we do expect subscriber growth to continue, but we're mostly focused now on delivering profitability by the end of fiscal 24. You know, we had a great quarter as you just... You hear the first thing he says. He's asked about subscriber growth, and he does answer that question. He says, we are expecting subscriber growth to continue, but here's what we're really focused on. Profitability in overall streaming by the end of 2024. Netflix was once very unprofitable by every metric, and now the company is incredibly profitable. I think that Warren Buffett was wrong when he said that streaming is a bad business. I think that he was correct in saying that Paramount in the current stage they're in is a bad business, but streaming can be a great business, a great economic business. And this is a perception that's going to take a long time to change. Right now, investors are still concerned about Disney, but I think this company can post streaming profits in the future. The big question, the big caveat with Disney is are those streaming profits going to be more than what they lose in cable revenue? So they have some declining businesses with ESPN and cable TV, and then they have their growing business with Disney+. Plus. With Netflix, there's no declining businesses. Everything's growing. So the two stories are similar, but they're also a bit different. Now, this next part, they talk about completing the acquisition of Hulu. Disney just recently bought out the remainder of Hulu, which was widely expected. But now he talks about their integration plans. And this is something that it does raise a couple red flags for me. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Um, further connect the dots between Disney Plus and Hulu and, and ultimately offer even a, a three play or a, a triple bundle with ESPN. It's three great sets of streaming assets. And in December, he talks about having the triple bundle, having Hulu, ESPN and Disney Plus all bundled together at a reduced cost than the services individually. And to me, that sounds a lot like cable TV. Bob, it sounds like you're moving away from cable TV to just doing cable TV, but on the internet. That's what I see Disney moving towards, and that's where I see the red flags. The reason that I love Netflix is because of the simplicity of the product. You just have one thing. Everyone has the same library. You sign up for it, you use it, and you have shows. There's no big bundle. There's no different packages. I think if you start getting into that category of all these different packages and services, you're getting back to cable. So... That's what I thought was a red flag here, but overall, I still like the direction Disney's going. And the one thing that he mentions over and over again, repeatedly, is cost cutting. Getting cost cut so that they can grow their cash flows this year and next year. So Disney should be expecting big free cash flow growth next year. And I think that will be the biggest thing that pushes the stock up. And overall, I looked at this earnings report as very positive. So there you have the two companies. Now, overall, I think you know which one I'm gonna pick if I had to invest in one of them. My pick would be FICO. I think it fits the qualifications and characteristics I'm looking for more accurately. 
FICO is highly efficient. It doesn't have much capex. It has a very clear growth path. It has a very wide moat. There's not many companies that can compete with it. It has a very bought-in management team. They haven't had a messy deal with politics. I think the company just has a more streamlined, straightforward way of making money in the future. The big problem with FICO is the valuation. It's more difficult to get behind. Disney, on the other hand, is at a much cheaper valuation. It is a value play. It's a recovery company. But it also comes with a lot more challenges and uncertainty. It has more competition with every aspect of its business. So when I look at the qualities, I think that FICO has more clear qualities than Disney. But in terms of what company will outperform over the next year, it's very difficult to say. I could see Disney having a decent run up if they really get their cash flows back, which there's a good chance of that. So if you're long Disney right now, I don't think that's such a bad bet. Right now for me, I'm sitting out both of them, but I do have FICO on the watch list. That's all for this episode. If you want more content, exclusive episodes, more fun stuff, join the Patreon. I think you'll like it.